He began humming a Mexican folk song and then lifted his head abruptly and looked at me. His eyes were fierce and burning. I wanted to look away or close my eyes, but to my utter amazement, I could not break away from his gaze. He asked me to tell him what I'd seen in his eyes. I said that I saw nothing, but he insisted I had to voice what his eyes had made me feel aware of. I struggled to make him understand that the only thing his eyes made me aware of was my embarrassment, and the way he was looking at me was very discomforting. He did not let go. He kept a steady stare. It was not an outright menacing or mean look. It was rather a mysterious but unpleasant gaze. He asked me if he reminded me of a bird. A bird? I exclaimed. Yes, he said softly. A bird. A very funny bird. He locked his gaze on me again and commanded me to remember. He said with an extraordinary conviction that he knew I had seen that look before. My feelings of the moment were that the old man provoked me against my honest desire every time he opened his mouth. I stared back at him in obvious defiance. Instead of getting angry, he began to laugh. He slapped his thigh and yelled as if he were riding a wild horse. Then he became serious and told me it was of utmost importance that I stop fighting him and remember the funny bird he was talking about. Look into my eyes, he said. His eyes were extraordinarily fierce. There was a feeling about them that actually reminded me of something, but I was not sure what it was. I pondered upon it for a moment, and then I had a sudden realization. It was not the shape of his eyes, nor the shape of his head, but some cold fierceness in his gaze that had reminded me of a look of the eyes of a falcon. At the very moment of that realization, he was looking at me askew, and for an instant, my mind experienced a total chaos. I thought I had seen a falcon's features instead of Don Juan's. The image was too fleeting, and I was too upset to have paid more attention to it. In a very excited tone, I told him I could have sworn I had seen the features of a falcon on his face. He had another attack of laughter. I have seen the look in the eyes of falcons. I used to hunt them when I was a boy, and in the opinion of my grandfather, I was good. He had a chicken farm, and falcons were a menace to his business. I had forgotten until that moment the fierceness of their eyes had haunted me for years, but it was so far in the past, I had thought I had lost memory of it. I used to hunt falcons, I said. I know it, Domond replied matter-of-factly. His tone carried such a certainty that I began to laugh. I thought he was a preposterous fellow. He had the gall to sound as if he knew I had hunted falcons. I felt supremely contemptuous of him. Why do you get so angry? He asked in a tone of genuine concern. I did not know why. He began to probe me in a very usual manner. He asked me to look at him again and tell me about the very funny bird he reminded me of. I struggled against him and out of contempt said there was nothing to talk about. Then I felt compelled to ask him why he had said he knew I used to hunt falcons. Instead of answering me, he again commented on my behavior. He said I was a very violent fellow that was capable of frothing at the mouth at the drop of a hat. I protested that that was not true. I had always had the idea I was rather congenial and easygoing. I said it was his fault for forcing me out of control with his unexpected words and actions. Why the anger? he asked. I took stock of my feelings and reactions. I really had no need to be angry with him. He again insisted I should look into his eyes and tell him about the strange falcon. He had changed his wording. He had said before, a very funny bird. Then he substituted it with strange falcon. The change in wording summed up a change in my own mood. I had suddenly became sad. He squinted his eyes until there were two slits and said in an overdramatic voice that he was seeing a very strange falcon. He repeated his statement three times as if he were actually seeing it there in front of him. Don't you remember it? He asked. I don't remember anything of the sort. What's strange about the falcon? I asked. You must tell me that, he replied. I insisted that I had no way of knowing what he was referring to, therefore I could not tell him anything. Don't fight me. Fight your sluggishness and remember. I seriously struggled for a moment to figure him out. It did not occur to me I could just as well have tried to remember. There was a time when you saw a lot of birds, he said as though cueing me. I told him when I was a child I lived on a farm 
and had hunted hundreds of birds. He said if that was the case, I should not have any difficulty remembering all the funny birds I had hunted. He looked at me with a question in his eye, as if he had given me the last clue. I have hunted so many birds that I can't recall anything about them. This bird is special, he replied in an almost whisper. This bird is a falcon. I became involved again in figuring out what he was driving at. Was he teasing me? Was he serious? After a long interval, he urged me again to remember. I felt it was useless for me to try to end his play. The only other thing I could do was join him. Are you talking about a falcon that I've hunted? I asked. Yes. So this happened when I was a boy? Yes. But you said you're seeing a falcon in front of you right now. I am. What are you trying to do to me? I'm trying to make you remember. What? What for heaven's sake? A falcon, swift as light, he said, looking me in the eyes. I felt my heart had stopped. Now look at me. But I did not. I heard his voice as a faint sound. Some stupendous recollection had taken me wholly. The white falcon. It all began with my grandfather's explosion of anger upon taking account of his young chickens. They had been disappearing in a steady and disconcerting manner. He personally organized and carried out a meticulous vigil, and after days of steady watching, we finally saw a big white bird flying away with a young chicken in its claws. The bird was fast and apparently knew its route. It swooped down from behind some trees, grabbed the chicken, and flew away through an opening between two branches. It happened so fast that my grandfather had hardly seen it, but I did, and I knew it was indeed a falcon. My grandfather said if that was the case, it had to be an albino. We started the campaign against the albino falcon, and twice I thought I had gotten it. It even dropped its prey, but it got away. It was too fast for me. It was also very intelligent. It never came back to hunt on my grandfather's farm. I would have forgot all about it had my grandfather not needled me to hunt the bird. For two months, I chased the albino falcon all over the valley where I lived. I learned its habits and could almost intuit its route of flight, yet its speed and suddenness of its appearance would always baffle me. I could boast that I had prevented it from taking its prey, perhaps every time we met, but I could never bag it. In the two months that I carried out the strange war against the albino falcon, I came close to it only once. I had been chasing it all day and I was tired. I had sat down to rest and fell asleep under a tall eucalyptus tree. The sudden cry of the falcon woke me up. I opened my eyes without making any other movement and saw a whitish bird perched on the highest branches of the eucalyptus tree. It was the albino falcon. The chase was over. It was going to be a difficult shot. I was lying on my back and the bird had its back turned to me. There was a sudden gust of wind and I used it to muffle the noise of my rifle. I wanted to wait until the bird had turned or at least had began to fly so I would not miss it, but the albino falcon remained motionless. In order to take a better shot, I would have needed to move and the falcon was too fast for that. I thought that my best alternative was to wait, and I did, a long, long time. Perhaps what affected me was the long wait, or perhaps it was the loneliness of the spot where the bird and I were. I suddenly felt a chill up my spine, and in an unprecedented action, I stood up and left. I did not even look back to see if the bird had flown away. I never attached any significance to my final act with the albino falcon. However, it was terribly strange I did not shoot it. I had shot dozens of falcons before. On the farm where I grew up, shooting birds or hunting any kind of animal was a matter of course. Don Juan listened attentively as I told him the story of the albino falcon. How'd you know about the white falcon? I asked when I finished. I saw it. Where? Right here, in front of you. He said that the white bird was like an omen, and that not shooting it down was the only right thing to do. Your death gave you a little warning, he said with a mysterious tone. It always comes as a chill. What are you talking about? I asked nervously. He really made me nervous with his spooky talk. You know a lot about birds. You've killed too many of them. You know how to wait. You have waited patiently for hours. I know that. I am seeing it. His words caused great turmoil in me. I thought that what annoyed me the most about him was his certainty. I could not stand his dogmatic assurances about the issues of my own life that I was not sure about myself. His words caused great turmoil in me. 
I thought that what annoyed me the most about him was his certainty. I could not stand his dogmatic assurances about my issues in my own life that I was not sure about myself. I became engulfed in my feelings of dejection, and I did not see him leaning over me until he actually had whispered something in my ear. I did not understand at first until he repeated it. He said that my death was there staring at me, and if I turned when he signaled me, I might be capable of seeing it. He signaled me with his eyes. I turned and I thought I saw a flickering movement over the boulder. A chill ran through my body. The muscles of my abdomen contracted involuntarily, and I experienced a, a jolt, a spasm. After a moment, I regained my composure, and I explained away the sensation of seeing the flickering shadow as an optical illusion caused by my head turning so abruptly. Death is our eternal companion. It is always to our left, at arm's length. It was watching you when you were watching the White Falcon. It whispered in your ear, and you felt its chill, as you felt it today. It has always been watching you. It always will until the day it taps you. He extended his arm and touched me lightly on the shoulder, and at the same time, he made a deep clicking sound with his tongue. The effect was devastating. I almost got sick to my stomach. You're the boy who stalked game and waited patiently, as death waits. You know very well that death is to our left, the same way you were to the left of the White Falcon. His words had the strange power to plunge me into an unwarranted terror. My only defense was my compulsion to commit to writing everything he had said. How can anyone feel so important when we know that death is stalking us? I had the feeling my answer was not really needed. I could not have said anything anyway. A new mood possessed me. The thing to do when you're impatient is to turn to your left and ask advice from your death. An immense amount of pettiness is dropped if your death makes a gesture to you, or if you catch a glimpse of it, or if you just have the feeling that your companion is there watching you. He leaned over again and whispered in my ear that if I turned to my left suddenly upon seeing his signal, I could again see my death on the boulder. His eyes gave an almost imperceptible signal, but I did not dare look. I told him that I believed him that he did not have to press the issue any further because I was terrified. He had one of his roaring belly laughs. He replied that the issue of our death was never pressed enough, and I argued that it would be meaningless for me to dwell on my death since such a thought would only bring discomfort and fear. You're full of crap. Death is the only wise advisor we have. Whenever you feel, as you always do, that everything is going wrong and you're about to be annihilated, turn to your death and ask if that is so. Your death will tell you that you're wrong and nothing really matters outside its touch. Your death will tell you, I haven't touched you yet. He shook his head and seemed to be waiting for my reply. I had none. My thoughts were running rampant. He had delivered a staggering blow to my egotism. The pettiness of my being annoyed with him was monstrous in the light of my death. 